On the youth page of our current website, you will find what we believe is the goal of youth ministry. The goal of youth ministry here at Second Presbyterian Church is the transformation of lives, the relationship with God, and with one another. We believe that young people need opportunities for meaningful experiences of faith, authentic relationships with one another and with adults, and the freedom to play joyfully together. The youth program here at Second has a long history, a history that proves to be one of the foundational pillars of this church. Our centennial history book, A Second Century, states that from its beginning, Second Presbyterian Church was responsive to the needs of the young. In the fall of 1894, the session had granted the use of the church house to the Young People's Society to have an entertainment for its benefit. And only three years later, there were three of what the session called Young People's Societies. The YPSCE, which stood for the Young People's Society of Christian Education, the Willing Workers, and the Little Lights. In April of that same year, 1897, the YPSCE had 20 members who contributed $6.50 to the church for current expenses. The Willing Workers had 15 members who raised $12.16 for hymn books. And the 43 members of Little Lights donated $26.59 for foreign missions. And given the times, those sums were substantial. Interestingly enough, that very same year, the Young People's Society of Christian Education submitted a constitution and bylaws to the session. After making several amendments, the YPSCE was dissolved and the organization of a Westminster League was approved. At some point, the name changed again because during the time Dr. Ro Arthur Robotham was pastor, the young people were organized as what was called the Christian Endeavor. Some of the younger members of the church thought it was called Christian and Devil. The Christian Endeavor gathered on Sunday nights with enthusiasm, and sometimes they met during the week for socials in homes. Fast forward to today, our high school girls meet every other Wednesday evening in various homes of members who host them. This weekday gathering is called Midweek Manna. Well, Christian education in all its forms for all ages is one of the most important ministries of Second Presbyterian Church. And thinking back over our history, you cannot talk about Christian education without mentioning Mary Bigham. Her tenure here stretched two pastorates. Mary was the face of welcome and gathering, especially for her work with the Sunday school, the young people of the church, and the women of the church. She was in the middle of things, in a good way, working constructively and lovingly on every facet of Christian education. Her love for church and faith were contagious. And as our history books states, she was a past mistress at bringing fun, food, and games to the church house. With such a strong leader in place, the programs for children and youth would follow suit, growing into a strong and prominent piece of church life. The Christian Endeavor was an organization when Dr. Edmonds began his ministry in 1923. These meetings were held on Sunday evenings in the church house. And legendary names that preceded Mary Bigham included Dorothy Gibney, listed as president of Christian Endeavor in 1923, Tina Richardson, listed as superintendent of Christian Endeavor in the early and mid-1920s, James Paxton in 1926 became superintendent followed by Mary Bigham in 1929, who was the first full-time staff member in education. In February 1930, the name of the group was changed to the Young People's Society. And in 1937, the group became known as Young People of the Church. And this group of young people were very active in the church, and that continued for years to come. During the years that Dr. Hollingsworth was pastor at Second, the enthusiasm and commitment to young people continued. According to his son Hayden, 
youth gatherings were a focal point of the social life. There would be 50 to 60 young people who gathered for dinner and study, and almost half were non-members. Actually, these youth gatherings were more like dates for them, and some marriages even blossomed out of those meetings. During these years, the youth began to go out on trips and conferences like the Synod of Virginia's Conference at Massanetta, which gathered between 700 and 800 young people. And Montreat Conference, formerly known as the Assembly's Youth Camp, gathered hundreds of participants as well. The youth program at Second didn't simply revolve around Sunday evening social gatherings. A heavy emphasis was on Sunday school as well, then split between junior high and senior high. Hayden remembers with much fondness Beverly T. and Helen Fitzpatrick. Bev taught the boys, Helen taught the girls. And these two made lasting impressions on each of those young people. Hayden recalls that the boys took up two offerings. One went to the church. The other was collected for a boys' dinner at Archie's Lobster House. And what comes to mind when you think of Archie's Lobster House? Pecan pie. Even more, the youth choir was a big success at that time. Youth gatherings were focused on dinner, recreation, study, and music. And you really didn't have a choice to participate or not. The youth choir had about 20 to 30 students in it, and the success of the youth choir continued as well, eventually doing youth choir tours across the region during the summer. And communicants class or confirmation class is a step in the life of faith that almost all of our young people experience. And the experience has lasting impression. It has evolved over the years. And it has been told that confirmation class was really a lesson on the catechism. And the final exam was to recite the Apostles' Creed to Dr. Hollingsworth. One story I heard is that the confirmands were in Dr. Holly's study, each one nervous at the idea of standing and reciting the Apostles' Creed all by yourself, in front of your peers, and especially in front of the pastor, the Dr. Hollingsworth. Before they began to recite, Dr. Holly would say, you ready? Let's all say it together. What a relief. <laughs> The final exam evolved into writing personal statements of faith, which for some has been a meaningful moment and more perhaps meaningful is the, to the parents in hearing their child profess their personal faith. Nowadays, confirmands present a creative faith project as part of their examination. The creative faith project allows them to express their faith in a way that is meaningful to them, using the gifts and passions God has given each of them. And to be honest, the elders on session look forward to this examination. As each pastor came and went, their successor continued to build on the strong foundation laid for the young people of Second. And when Dr. Klein began his ministry at Second, he was happy to inherit such a vigorous youth program. Just before Klein's pastorate began in 1968, the youth program had a bit of a shift due to some complaints about the ninth and 10th grade students that were taken to see the movie, The Graduate. And although parental permission had been required and had been received, the thought that such a movie should not have been advertised in the church bulletin. This led to the Youth Activities Committee to sponsor a Saturday night dance in the fellowship hall. The event was a success, and with such encouragement, the formal establishment of a youth club came by 1974. This new program adoption did not come lightly or quickly. Leaders of the senior highs researched and attended seminars held at Massanetta Conference Center. Both Klein and Associate Pastor Frank Mays joined leaders in attending the seminars, as did Neva Delgado, the DCE at the time, adult leaders Robert and Betty Cole, Beverly T. and Helen Fitzpatrick, and Jack and Jane Butler. Speaking on the 1980s, Klein believed that the adoption of the youth club program has, has had a significant influence on the church, which will continue for the years ahead. 
It is not as effective as some would like it to have been, but many churches envy what we're able to do. Youth Club met on Sunday evenings for the purpose of learning, fellowship, recreation, and service to others. There were at any given time, any given night, 70 or more participants for Youth Club. And I was told that at least one parent must be present to help. Parents could help with music, crafts, dinner, recreation, or be a table leader in discussion. The success of Youth Club cannot be attributed to one head pastor, to Dr. Klein alone, or any minister during their respective time, but attribution to the staff and the incredible lady leadership contributed great, greatly. During the 1970s, Second participated in work camps in West Virginia, and for several years, Associate Pastor Frank Mays led many of our young people to these camps where they repaired porches and roofs, built outhouses, and engaged in other helpful construction projects for the disadvantaged there. These experiences were formative, even transformative, and influenced some career choices in the future of our teenagers. Alice Lofton was the first youth club director, and she was actually salaried with a payment of $50 a month, which she turned right back to the church as an offering. Other directors included Susie Feinauer and Lucy Ellett. Stephen Emmett became the associate pastor for Christian education in 1990. He was a young and gifted person, and the youth attracted to his contagious spirit. Stephen and his wife, Barbara, were beloved by the youth, and their departure was really tough for that group of young folks. And every transition is difficult, but through those interim periods, the youth advisor stepped up to keep the enthusiasm and connections going. One advisor who has been involved since the early 1990s is Jim Baton, or as some of you know him, Midge. Midge has made lasting impressions on youth then and even now. From mission trips to Montreat to teaching Sunday school and being a youth advisor on Sunday evenings, he has a gift of connection. I asked Midge some of his thoughts and he replied with, as I give, I receive so much in return. I believe this is a theme that runs deep throughout youth programs here at Second. Ministers, adults, and even youth in giving their time, in giving their talents, they receive much in return. The lessons of faith, the laughs of connection, and the small moments that seem to stop time all happen as we seek to be a gift in someone else's life. From Stephen Emick to Gerald Carter to Willie Williams, and in recent years, Elizabeth Smith and Rachel Thompson Orphan. Alongside many lay leaders, they have continued to build upon the work and witness of Second's youth. Midweek Manna began during Elizabeth Smith's time here, and this program continues today and has been a staple in the connections between our high school girls. Youth Council was reformed by Rachel Thompson Orfield to give voice to our youth in planning and implementation of youth programs. This too continues today, and they are given more and more responsibility and leadership roles. And outreach and service remain a vital and transformative experience for our youth. Whether international mission trips to the Dominican Republic, domestic trips to Florida or the Appalachia region, or local mission days, it is true, in giving, you ultimately receive. I am standing in the intersection, a house purchased in 2008 for the sole purpose to provide a dedicated youth space big enough to house the various programs. The intersection is the primary location for Christian education for youth at our church, but it is also a space that the youth claim as their own. It's the space where friendships are built, where tough questions of faith are raised, where people laugh and play and connect with one another as a church family. Over the years, the youth program here at Second seems to get better and better, some say. It is not that the successors are better than those who served before. It is the fact that such a strong and faithful foundation has been laid over the almost 135-year history 
that with each new pastor, each new associate with new leadership, the program continues to grow and thrive. From our roots to our reach, may God continue to be present in the work of youth ministry here at Second Presbyterian Church for another 135 years.